Hi everyone, this is Dr. Maples. I want to talk about three exciting sociological thinkers. Now this first person I'm going to talk about was really considered our first sociologist. As I understand it, he was also the person who taught the very first courses in sociology. In that sense, all sociologists today descend from this person's work. It was a guy by the name of Durkheim. Now Durkheim also was a, basically a product of the French Revolution. He was born in 1858, um, over... 50, 60 years uh, since the, the French Revolution had happened, but he still understood how it reverberated through France, through Napoleon's wars, and really how this had a pretty horrible impact on France overall. Now, as he understands this field of sociology and picks up this new book, so to speak, that uh, Auguste Comte has written on this new field, it really resounds with him. It's interesting because with Durkheim, he actually came from a long line of priests, and it was expected that he would be yet another generation of following in the family footsteps. And in reading Comte's work, it really resounded with him that there was this idea that the individual's experiences and decisions are kind of shaped by the things happening around him because he very much saw that pressure. He as an individual realized there was a lot of pressure for him to be, just as his uh, grandfather and uncles and others had been, um, to be a minister. Well, he breaks with those ties. In fact, he ends up becoming our very first sociologist. And in doing so, he's still very keen about the Age of Enlightenment, much like Comte was. So he, in taking up this idea that sociology is a legitimate field, starts with the idea that, look, if this is going to work, we have to follow the same scientific method that everyone else has. We have to have concrete methods for studying our society. In fact, it makes sociology into the methodological discipline that it is even today. And if you want my opinion, and this isn't on the test, if you want my opinion, he's the reason that sociology exists today. Otherwise, it probably would have been some dusty tome in a bookshelf somewhere that would have been overlooked and forgotten. Comte, even though he wasn't a particularly exciting person, I'm to understand, was very much the reason that we have this field today. Now, it's exciting because with Comte's work, he focused on trying to understand some of the very things that were shaping the individual's experience. In fact, he used something he called social facts to explain why different people did different things. He started with uh, the idea of suicide, something he considered the most individual and personal of acts. Yet he was able to demonstrate statistically that suicides can actually be influenced by other things happening around them. An individual's decision to die by their own hand was actually changing based on what faith they came from. In fact, he found that Protestants were more apt to kill themselves than Catholics. And he argued in his version that people who were in the Catholic Catholic faith had a stronger support system, had more people around them, and there was also a maybe rejection of the idea of suicide. Whereas Protestants had more freedom, but they also had less family support or maybe more uh, less religious community support. This was an exciting idea. It's also really cool too because it's this massive book that today we could have done the statistical analysis on that in like 10 minutes, and I'm sure it took him years. So it's kind of nice to have the technology we have today. Thanks, Age of Enlightenment. <laughs> Anyways, these sociological facts, or social facts rather, they may sound just a little bit like Mill's idea of history. In fact, that's exactly how it worked. Comte and now Durkheim was thinking about the individual's experience. And Durkheim uses this idea of the social facts to explain the things happening around the individual that might in some small way shape their decisions. So you can see where Mill's idea comes from a long time ago. Now, there's another guy by the name of Max Weber. I want to point out, too, notice that it's Weber, not Weber. W-E-B-E-R is Weber, but when we put an extra w uh, B on there, it would be Weber, kind of like the company that makes the grills. Max Weber is a political economist. He's very much involved in the political scene of his country. And he continues thinking about Durkheim's work as uh, this needs to be a, a field, sociology needs to be a field with a very methodological approach. It needs to stick to that scientific method that was so important in understanding this new knowledge about this thing, society. 
Now, for Weber, he was very interested in how the individual experience was impacted by things like authority. As a political economist, he wanted to understand how the relationship of power could shape an individual's experience. Now, by authority, we mean domination, the ability to force someone to do something they may or may not want to do. It's kind of like the idea that when the police turn on the blue lights, you're pretty much forced into pulling over. And if you're not going to pull over, they're going to um, elevate the situation to eventually pull you over. The whole thing is that they have the authority here that you will in some form eventually be pulled over. So that's an interesting relationship. How is it they were able to force people to do things, even though they may not want to do things? Maybe you don't want to pull over. You're like, no, I want to go to Sonic because they've still got the, the half price, um, you know, Route 44 strawberry limeades. No, the police officer says you have to pull over and that's how it is. Same thing with the college. We say you have to take certain classes to graduate and you have to get 120 or more hours to get this certificate. So you don't really have a choice. Our authority forces you to do that. It's kind of funny too because those diplomas you could really make at home with some stuff from like, you know, Michael's or maybe Amazon. But their certificate only has value if we make it. Isn't that kind of cool? We'll talk about that in a later lecture. That's actually what we call material culture. Now, with this re relationship between the individual's decision-making and uh, authority, Ma Weber was very interested in how the individual experience was shaped by that. If we can tell someone they have to do something, then we can shape their decisions. Think about how the people who are important to you or who are leaders to you might shape your decisions. Think about maybe how your family and the information that they gave you might have given you some sort of authority, expectation that you would do something. You will go to college. You will do this. You will do that. Do you have a choice? Well, in some cases, maybe. When you see the blue lights, no, you got to pull over. You don't have any choice on that. But that's the cool thing about Weber. He took sociology in this direction of trying to understand how individuals might have their decisions forced upon them. And again, we see how this sounds just like C. Wright Mill's idea of the sociological imagination. Now, this last guy, he requires a bit of additional information. I want you to go ahead and take all the things you've heard about socialism, communism, and Karl Marx, and just set those aside because they don't really have a place in our class. You can save those for your political science classes, but that's not really what we're interested in. In fact, Karl Marx, and this is my personal opinion, Karl Marx was kind of a bit of a loser in a lot of ways. He was a very aggressive person who um, probably borrowed work, borrowed work from other people uh, without giving them credit. Um, his family life, you can read about on Wikipedia, but he wasn't always the most uh, kind person. He named all of his daughters Jenny, which that was also his wife's name. I always thought that was a very strange decision, but it's whatever. I want to forget all that, though, because this guy is kind of tainted when we hear the name Karl Marx. We have all sorts of ideas, and I want to set all those aside because they're not relevant to our conversation. In fact, I'm going to go back to the advice of my mom here. My mom always said, every person on this planet has at least one good idea. And in this case, regardless of my feelings about Karl Marx the person, I can say that Karl Marx the scholar did have at least one good idea. How is it that the resources we have available to us might shape the decisions that we make. It's interesting because, again, going back to the individualistic fallacy that we talked about in a previous lecture, we tend to say that individuals choose their fate. But that doesn't feel entirely true. Let's go back to the example of most of our college students coming from $100,000 or plus households. Is that because students coming from less wealthy households are lazy? Is it because they choose not to go to college? Or is there something else happening there? I mean, me, I came from a less than $100,000 household. And one of the things that always amazes people today when I talk to other faculty is that when I was trying to go to college, I didn't even know FAFSA was a thing. I didn't know that I could apply for government loans or student loans. I was trying to pay for it out of my own pocket, whether it was borrowing money from people or just saving ridiculously to make sure that I had the funds. I didn't know student loans were a thing. I know that sounds crazy, right? And yet I hear that even today. Lots of students don't know that student loans are available. Moreover, they may not even know how student loans work after you graduate. Some people think that student loans are forgiven. They aren't. 
let me be very clear about that. They are not forgiven. There are programs that may forgive them over a period of time, but you may not qualify for those. In fact, I found that the one that I thought was going to forgive my student loans would actually last longer than it took me to pay the loans off myself. <laughs> it's nuts, right? Getting back to Karl Marx, he wanted to think about how the resources around us shaped our experience. And we see in that case that it's not the story that these students are somehow less intelligent or less capable, but there's something in there that might shape that individual experience. In fact, for Karl, he would simply argue that there's something happening around the individual, history, biography, history, biography, and that it was shaping the individual's decision-making process. Do you see how that sounds like Seawright Mills? It's beautiful because C. Wright Mills in the 1950s took all these ideas that had been around for a hundred and something years, boiled them down to the just most beautiful essence to explain why our field feels the way it does, why it studies what it does, and why it's committed to the idea that we can make a difference. Three important thinkers, in fact, we call them the big three in sociology. One, a sociologist, that would be uh, Durkheim, and the other two political economists, sociologists of a sort who are interested in the relationship between the economy and politics. Now, we're going to call it there. In our next lecture, we're going to meet three more thinkers, but these are American sociologists who are important in shaping how we understand sociology in the United States. We're going to call it there. Make sure and take care of your quizzes. If you got questions, you know where to find me. We'll talk soon. See ya.